Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's show. My name is Spencer Walsh, welcoming you to this Monday episode of Newsflash. Really do appreciate you joining us here today. We are in for a good one. We are keeping you posted on the latest on U.S. sanctions in, in Cuba, in Venezuela, how they've hampered the fight against the global coronavirus vaccination effort and why they are being used as a fig leaf for new protests that are currently getting mass media attention all of a sudden. We'll take a look at the suspicious nature of everything going on there. Also, we are have a, a gr- great new piece to take a look at from David Sorota talking about how U.S. workers are funding the war on themselves, how workers' retirement savings are enriching billionaires now and in every way imaginable, financing the apocalypse. There's nothing you can do about it anymore. It's just going to be all-encompassing. Also, we're going to take you first to Haiti. It's going to be pretty much Haiti week here on SWR, and we've got a Hidden History episode for you going through the big, full history of Haiti right now, uh, all the way from Toussaint Louverture's slave rebellion up until the current day. We'll have that full explainer coming for you this Thursday on Hidden History, but... In the meantime, join us now for the latest on what's going on there after the president was assassinated. So, yeah, we're going to keep you posted on all things Haiti. Don't uh, d- don't worry about it. We're, we, we got you covered on that front. But, uh, and yeah, we're, we're going to get him right to it now. Um, we are going for the, from the New York Times here. This is the, the latest information. I put in a lot of effort into, like, just I probably spent the past hour researching for sources that kind of would better explain the situation um, because there, as, as we know, as we know, there is not a lot of uh, trust to be had. And I think it's very, very, like, it's very justifiable. Like, they've earned it. They've proven time and time again that, especially when it comes to kind of foreign policy, uh, and especially in areas where I'm not particularly as well-versed, like, I am not an expert on the, the complete and total history of Haiti from uh, – uh, Toussaint Louverture through the French uh, French occupation or French colonialization through the um, Toussaint Louverture slave rebellion and everything that happened after, um, it really, really was a in, in, an incredibly tough and incredibly um, kind of traumatic time for uh, Haitians for pre- pretty much from 1806 onwards. They'd never really fully been granted their sovereignty. Uh, and the U.S. has had a big role, especially in the last 120 odd years in playing that or really ever since I believe they invaded in the forties, uh, they've had a, a, a big role in that. So more like 80, 80 years now. Um, they've, they've had a very, very big role in this. So we're, we're going to keep you try and keep you posted on the most info based. We're going to try and skirt around us. Imperial propaganda is uh, pretty much what I am telling you, but we have to, uh, for, for sourcing, we're going to have to just cause they have all the latest information here. We're going to go, with the New York Times, um, so this is it's, it's all it's all very interesting. We got various kind of right wing governments working in concert here, uh, but we start with this Haitian born doctor based in Florida. He's been assassinated as a key suspect in the assassination of. Um, he's been arrested. Sorry, the key suspect of the assassination of President, former President Jovenel Moise of Haiti, uh, and pretty much the for if you don't remember. Uh, again, last week's sh- show, I believe it was our Friday show, where we talked about kind of some some of the central context around this is um, this guy, he has been largely funded by, you know, the U.S. and kind of in- the quote-unquote international community who has had seen a big, big profit from, um, from Haiti in the last, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ever since – we we've seen all the way since you know what the Clinton Foundation did with them after the the earthquake there, sending relief. Uh, American Red Cross, for example, uh, a not just just the Red Cross in general, ma- raising tons of money um, all across the world in the wake of the earthquake for Haiti. Uh, but ended up uh, it was almost five hundred million dollars, and they ended up building uh, only six houses so <laughs> for for the people 
in Haiti uh, with that money, really raising some of the questions about what games the United States and others have been playing, and the, uh, at least with just the international community at large has been playing for uh, with Haiti for so, so long. Um, so, yeah, he's been arrested in the former president, Jovenel Moise. He obviously has faced a lot of protests for just blatant corruption, blatant instances of corruption, and um, really the biggest instance of corruption um, – I mean, you could say it was the fact where he hi- pretty much hired thugs to go into Haiti's central bank and try and steal $80 million. But it probably would be the fact that he tried to stay with the help, by the way, of U.S. governments one year after his term. He pretty much used a, a blatant misinterpretation of the Constitution um, that pretty much said we, despite any, like, ir- ir- disregard any delays that the. Uh, elections may have in Haiti. You're supposed to get to begin your term the February February the seventh after you're elected. So this guy he was elected in February 2016. Moyes was, um, and he was supposed to serve for five years until 2021. He really didn't get certified. Tons and tons of delays and issues and irregularities with the the original Moyes election. Um, so he wasn't fully certified to serve until about a year later, which means, at least in his eyes, he should have one more year, uh, kind of in a very Trumpian style. Uh, but Biden has swooped in there to s- agree with him, of all people, Biden, who knows something about dealing with people who are misrepresenting their ter- ta- the time of their terms in office. Um, he came in, obviously, with a bunch of U.S. support, uh, statements from all over the world, EU, uh, OAS, Organization of American States, was pretty much the uh, American kind of front group for for representing their interests in the uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Um, what they've been doing is really pushing and very uh, very successfully pushing uh, and making Moyes feel like he was emboldened. So they've been emboldening him in a big way, uh, coming up to this moment where all of a sudden he has been assassinated. Um, and of course, there's been big protests building ever since February, and they've, as we talked about in the in the past, been even more revolutionary in character and even more left wing in character. Uh, if if not left wing, just more anarchist, a lot, just kind of uh, mad at everybody, as we talked about with Jimmy Barbecue last time on the on the last episode. Um, but we'll we'll see how long it takes to get to to Jimmy in this story, but we'll we'll go through it. Um. So pretty much what happened, this, the, yeah, this Haitian-born doctor based in Florida, he's been arrested in a, as a key suspect in the assassination of Moise. Um, oh, and we're now just getting a – we'll get, we'll get it in from Biden. Uh, Biden just had a – said something that we want to, uh, to get to in, in relation to Cuba. He called it a quote-unquote clarion call for freedom, what's going on there in Cuba. Uh, we'll, we'll get you posted on that next. But um, – to date, two dozen people have been arrested in the killing, but on Sunday, Haitian officials described the doctor, Christian Emmanuel Senon, as a central figure in the case. Even as the Haitian authorities offered their most detailed account so far of the plot to um, uh, uh, rare, uh, pretty much as the, as the plot to br- really prime the brazen, brazen assassination of the president in the bedroom of his private home last week. There was widespread skepticism among the, among the public of the official version of events, as there should be. There's a, there's a bunch of corruption. No one, no one really knows who's for, like, the people who are, the, the quote-unquote officials who are coming out there and saying what they're saying now. No one quite knows who they're, they're serving. So even as Haitian authorities offered offer their most detailed accounts so far, uh, widespread skepticism remains. An increasingly fraught struggle for control of the country is only adding to the general sense of unease and foreboding as an already grim situation in Haiti threatens to descend further out of control. A majority of sitting members of the Haitian parliament, which itself is in a state of dysfunction, are calling for a new government to replace the interim prime minister, Claude Joseph. Claude Joseph has issued a series of desperate pleas for foreign intervention to stabilize the nation, including calling on the United States to send troops, which makes it kind of very, very interesting to see what does he have to gain out of this and how will people respond, as we talked about in the last episode again, uh, how will they respond if United States troops come in and or maybe UN troops come in, and there's been a long and brutal history with UN peacekeeping forces uh, who have been in the in the area since the 90s after there was a coup there. Um, they have been pushing for some pretty pretty regressive policies in 
really so much so with the open, it's just be, it's beyond the policy at this point. It's the fact that there has been an outbreak of quote unquote UN babies who have been the the children of girls, pretty much who have been raped by UN peacekeeping forces when they were when they've been there uh, for quite uh, for for. 20, 30 years at this point. And that is that is why, of course, there is a lot of skepticism. AOC coming out there saying this is a bad idea about sending UN or US troops into Haiti. But um, Joseph, the interim prime minister, seems to think that is a good idea. So for, for those of you who don't know, yeah, like the UN babies were only one part of it. There was a massive cholera outbreak uh, that has been, that went through Haiti in uh, a few a few years back, because there were there were feces being like UN the UN was dumping feces water into like one of the biggest supplies of water in the center of the country, just absolutely insane stuff and uh, some important context that you will not hear about in the New York Times. Um, American officials signaled that they remain reluctant to provide military forces to Haiti to help secure order, but have sent a team of investigators to help looking uh, to help look into last week's assassination, which has left the country teetering. Haitian's national Haiti's national police chief Leon Charles said that Dr. Sanon played a vital role in the plot, but offered no explanation about how the doctor could have possibly taken control of the government. So apparently, the, the plan was to put this guy pretty much install him as president. Um, Sanon, this this Florida doctor, <laughs> Florida man tries to go be, t- tries to become Haitian president. <laughs> that's a that's probably a pretty good headline uh, if you're ever playing that that Florida man game. Um, so still the the arrest of Sanon added another element to the ele- uh, yet yet another element of intrigue to a rapidly moving investigation that stretched for all the way from Colombia to Miami. He arrived in a private plane in June with political operatives. Uh, and political objectives and contracted a private security firm to recruit the people who committed the act. The firm, he said, was a Venezuelan security company based in the United States called CTU. This guy Sanon did. Uh, During a raid at his home, the authorities said the police found a DEA cap. The team of the hitmen who assaulted Moise's home appeared to have falsely identified themselves as drug enforcement administration agents, six holsters, about 20 boxes of bullets, 24 unused shooting targets, and four license plates from the Dominican Republic. Of course, for those of you who are sorely lacking on geography, um, the Dominican Republic is literally in the same island as Haiti, and they are well, well known for pretty much being a staging ground for some some bad people to do some bad things uh, in Haiti, unfortunately. So... That is a, and of course they have, they don't have a bad history, they don't have a very good history uh, sharing that same island. There's a lot of kind of anti-Haitian sentiment in the Dominican Republic, unfortunately, but that is a whole other conversation. Um, but it's interesting to see the Dominican Republic already playing a role as it has so many times in other kind of like anti-Haitian government operations. Um, so the initial mission was that was given to these assailants was to protect an individual named Emmanuel Sanon, but afterwards the mission changed, Charles said, implying that Sanon had meant to install himself as president. Uh, a YouTube video recorded in 2011 titled Dr. Christian Sanon, Leadership for Haiti, appears to present Sanon as a potential leader of the country. In it, the speaker denounces the leaders of Haiti as corrupt plunderers of its resources. With me in power, you're going to have to tell me, what are you going to do with my uranium? <laughs> The speaker says, so before I give it up, you're going to have to tell me, what are you going to do with it? You're going to be very, very careful. What are you going to do with the oil that we have in the country? What are you going to do with the gold? Two Americans arrested last week said that uh, we have said that they were not in the room when the president was killed and they'd worked as only translators for the hit squad, according to a Haitian judge who interviewed them. They met with other participants at an upscale hotel in Petionville, the Petionville suburb of Port-au-Prince, the Haitian capital, uh, to plan the attack. The goal was to not not to kill the president, what the two Americans said, but to bring him to the National Palace. Um, interesting to see how that plot would have been. The, so maybe it was an accident. They went too far. They aimed in the wrong place. Um, that is what is being asserted by these two Americans who say they're translators. So it's going to be interesting to see. We're, we're, there's still more pieces here we got to be piecing together. But remember the theory again was last time that these were mercenaries hired by 
uh, Cuba's ruling families. This is from journalist Kim Ives, who's uh, done a lot of kind of uh, leftist, leftist journalist there, who's in Haiti, who's done a lot of work on this subject. Um, so a top security aide to President Juvenal Moyes had traveled to Bogota, Colombia's capital, several times in the months before President, the president's assassination last week. Uh, Colombian defense officials said on Monday morning, raising the prospects the attackers had inside help from someone like, I don't know, his security aid, top security aid. <laughs> Would make sense. Uh, the Colombian officials who are help, helping with a wide-ranging investigation into the president's death said that they're examining what connection, if any, there may be. Uh, there was between the trips uh, by head of presidential palace guard Dimitri Harard and the Colombian former soldiers accused by Haitians of having been involved in the killing. So these Spanish-speaking guys were apparently Colombian that we heard about last time. 20 Colombian veterans have been implicated in this killing. So right now they have a pretty pro, pro-U.S. pro government in there. They have Ivan Duque, uh, the current pretty pretty controversial, pretty unpopular leader of Colombia right now. Uh, just to take a look at his motivations. Uh, but, of course, Colombia could have been used as a staging ground for all other types of interest. Uh, we really don't know. It, and it's and it's something that, you know, it's just, it's just yet to be determined. Um, if you get, look up the off the coast of, uh, of Colombia, it's certainly possible to go across the Caribbean and get to, get to Haiti relatively uh, easily. But, yeah, it's, it's unclear who's pulling whose strings here. The, and this is the stuff that's probably going to take a big, long time to uh, unravel. Since January, Harada traveled to Ecuador, Panama, and the Dominican Republic. Uh, so Ecuador is, I believe, it's a pretty right-wing government uh, as well. Uh, they had an election there recently where another right-wing guy won. Um, Panama and the Dominican Republic, we talked about them, each time with a layover in Bogota. Uh on at least one occasion, he stayed in Bogota for several days. Uh, but the Colombian authorities have to establish a direct link between Harar and the captured former soldiers, officials said. Uh, at a news conference in Bogota, General Jorge Luis Vargas, a chief of the Colombian National Police, said that the number of Colombians captured in Haiti had risen to 21, three of whom were dead. The Colombians, Vargas said, who traveled from Colombia to the Dominican Republic and then on Haiti after their plane tickets were purchased by a company based in Florida. So very, very weird stuff. So we have Colombians traveling from Colombia to the DR and then on to Haiti to supposedly do this assassination. uh, And their tickets were purchased by a company based in Florida. And at least two of the Colombians, Duberney Capador and Germán Riviera Garcia, were working with the company, uh, CTU Security, from Florida. Uh, both or now dead. Colombia has some of the uh, is one of the best trained militaries in Latin America, and because of this, Colombian veterans are highly sought after by global security companies. They deploy to faraway places like Yemen and Iraq, often paying far more than they can expect to earn in Colombia. They have had a long history of fighting in various wars and paramilitary groups and you know guerrilla invasions, all that stuff. Um, so the country's lead prosecutor began looking into what role Haitian security forces may have had in an operation that killed the president and wounded his wife, but harmed no one else in the household or president's security, security retinue. So uh, they went after him and they got his wife. So that is that is it. No collateral damage, no nothing like that. Um, maybe the motivation was to bring him to the presidential palace. Maybe that's what some people wanted, but maybe the Colombians got a little bit rogue. We don't know. Maybe that's what the doctor wanted. Uh, but and the Americans, there's so many different characters in this. Uh, it is very, very confusing. So in Colombia, m- some family members of the detained Colombians say that the men went to Haiti to protect the president, not to kill him. That is only around, around it to the me- added to the many murky and often contradictory claims surrounding the assassination. Then on Sunday, uh, yesterday, the Haitian authorities said they arrested a Florida-based Haitian-born doctor whom they had described as a central figure in this plot. So, yeah, we got the Colombians. We got the U.S. getting involved in here. A lot of buttons being pushed. We do not quite know. Um, yeah, there's been years of strife, years of political gridlock and uh, violence to continue. Um, <laughs> there was no, I, 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 To keep in mind here, Throughout the throughout the presidential presidential term of Jovenel Moïse, uh, he's been dissolving parliament. He has fired judges who have said that he has to go because his term is up. It's he's pretty much been ruling by decree. So there's no there's been no parliament. There's been no uh, elected uh, forces of power, and the the people who are often put forth are incredibly unpopular 
kind of U.S. hand-picked options that do not get a lot of pull from the from the people. The last popular president, Aristides, um, he was he's he like last I believe held office in the '90s. We're going to get more into that on Thursday, but it's just an absolutely messy, messy, messy situation. Uh, and, it, and it all rests on this guy Claude Joseph, who is ho- holding it together by a thread at this point. All right, we're going to get back to uh, what's going on in Cuba next. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to the Spencer Walsh Radio Network. I want to tell you a little bit about our lineup for this summer. We start off with News Flash, all new, of course, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. You can't miss it. It's our flagship show to get caught up on everything happening in the world around you. But stick around for some history and some entertainment. Learn about all the things you never learned in history class every Thursday with Hidden History. And get ready for a fun night out or turn your living room into the club with uncultured live mixes every Saturday all summer long. The Spencer Walsh Radio Network is your home for summer sounds coming all season long. Every podcast is available everywhere, so you have no excuse not to listen. Okay, I do want to get into this today, what's going, been going on uh, in Cuba. And this really, I think, you got to read every, and it, it's very, very tough living in the United States because you're living in a media bubble. You're living in a, like, kind of the, kind of the center of um, empire and, you know, like Western power. So you're, you're living, kind of living in the heart of the beast here. So there is a lot of propaganda. There's a lot of misrepresentation about what's going on in Cuba and the pretty much Ever since that fateful day in 1959 where Fidel Castro assumed power, or not assumed power, pretty much overthrew the Batista regime, um, he, they, I think both, bro- yeah, both brothers are now dead, um, but that has still not stopped the United States' kind of cold war, uh, and sometimes even very hot war, it, kind of including committing and sponsoring acts of terrorism, acts of invasion, um, that has been... It just in a, a big, big part of what's been going on. And, and the, the sabotage efforts, the, the efforts to kill people, uh, the efforts to kill Castro, they have not, uh, not, not Castro anymore, but the efforts to sabotage uh, Cuba, regardless of how, you know, what happens to the people, um, should be kind of understood as just a long, long project to overthrow, overthrow the uh, socialist, communist, whatever, revolution, um, in Cuba, so let's get into it. Um, so yeah, and it, I think we really got to start it with kind of the most recent round of just brutal, brutal sh- sanctions um, in Cuba. So in Cuba, pretty much the smallest country in the world to produce its own COVID nineteen vaccines. Again, plural. Five immunizations are currently in clinical trials. That's another thing. Uh, Cuba's health and kind of uh, healthcare industry is probably one of the best, if not the best, in terms of. Um, the, the dual factors of price efficiency and effectiveness and efficacy, uh, probably the best in the world. Uh, it has five vaccines that are currently in clinical trials. Saberna 2 and Ad- Abdallah have reached phase three, making the island nation the only country in Latin America to reach the final stage in vaccine development. In the meantime, three other kinds of Cuban COVID-19 shots are in early trial phases. Last month, Cuban authorities opted to begin early distribution of the two most advanced vaccines, deciding the benefits of a mass inoculation campaign outweighed the risks. The director of Cuba's Finlay Institute of Vaccine, which uh, developed the Soberna 2 vaccine, that ca- said the country could produce 100 million doses um, by the end of the year, 70 million more than what Cuba needs internally. And while the Cuban government is focused on vaccinating its own population first, vaccine exports from Cuba may soon become a reality. Cuba, of all places, could play a role in ending the COVID-19 pandemic worldwide by sending millions upon millions of doses here to vaccinate um, the the third world and Africa and the poor, poor vaccination campaigns that have been going on there. 
Uh, according to a draft of a speech shared with the Intercept, Q's vice president of public health will announce the country's intention at the Progressive, in, Progressive International's summit for a uh, summit for vaccine internationalism to open a discussion about how to mobilize the, its vaccine candidates to support other countries that request aid. But for the time being, such plans are likely to be limited in scope as a result of the decades-long U.S. trade embargo and sanctions against the country. So the United States does not care about vaccinating the world. The United States does not care about um, getting out the COVID uh, pandemic and making the world a better place. They care about keeping their interests um, as the ones, the only ones on the world stage being met. And it's not even the interest of the American people. It's the interest of the American elite. Um, so that is what they're doing by holding off this kind of train embargo, stopping life-saving medicine from getting into and out of Cuba. Uh, we're seeing shortages. That's the reason why people are on the streets. It's because of shortages. How do these shortages happen? Hmm, what, what a shock. I, I guess things just go poof in the grocery stores. It's crazy, right? Um, yeah, so many developing countries lack the financial me uh, means to secure bilateral deals with vaccine makers on their own. As a result, more than 130 nations are relying on COVAX vaccine sharing initiatives backed by the WHO and funded by largely high-income countries and private donors. While COVAX has fallen well behind its original targets, um, G7 countries nevertheless called the platform the primary route for providing vaccines to the poorest countries at their summit um, back in June. One state hoping to make the use of the initiative is Venezuela, where the government claims attempts to access COVAX have been hampered by U.S. sanctions. Um, as early as 2021, the U.S. has imposed financial sanctions on 100 Venezuelan individuals and at least eight different entities, including the government, central bank, and state oil company. The list expanded under Donald Trump, but remains in place under Joe Biden. President Nicolas Maduro's government said it is aimed to work around these measures. Back in March, Maduro even cut a deal with opposition head uh, quote-unquote, interim president, uh, Juan Guaido, to free up $30 million in offshore cash frozen under American sanctions to help pay for COVID-19 shots. So, again, this is what they're doing. They are looking at the... And this, is the, this has been the policy of America towards these countries for pretty much the moment they turned socialist, which was deny them health, deny them medicine, deny them food, deny them basic economic acts. Like Cuba has been strangled, Venezuela has been strangled. It's clear as the, you know, the nose on my face. Um, it really has been a policy, a genocidal policy of knocking out people who happen to be living under regimes that they put in place that were and and, and enjoy popular support for the large part um, that are happen to be left of center. Like <laughs> that's literally all it is. Um, so let's go to where, what's going on now. And again, kind of cut through the New York Times imperialist propaganda here. Uh, Oscar Lopez and Ernesto Ladoño. Uh, by the way, that little bit there was from the Intercept talking about vaccine, uh, sanctions put in place. Uh, but inc incredibly impressive program from Cuba in terms of, in terms of vaccine development and the efforts from Venezuela in terms of getting past these sanctions and literally having to beg to this rando, Juan Guaido, who the United States probably like pl plucked out of Miami or wherever, um, to lead the State Department campaign to overthrow Vene um, the Venezuelan government and make lives, the lives of the Venezuelan people even more miserable. Um, so <laughs> what happened, uh, what's going on now is um, we're seeing the largest protest movement in decades sweeping Cuba, New York Times saying here. Uh, and, of course, there has been, while there has been some people on the streets, obviously, uh, we don't know why they're out in the streets. We don't know who's pushing them to go out in the streets. I think th these are questions, especially when you look at the, the past U.S. history with Cuba and the instigation efforts that they've done and pretty much their, their entire worldwide history. It's very, very fair to be asking these questions out in the street. We've also seen videos of kind of counter-protesters with much, much larger uh, crowds coming out and saying that, you know, we are for Fidel, we're for the revolution, and we want the, we're, they're putting the blame on the United States, because there's no, there's no denying that Cuba is in a bad way economically, held, like, uh, in terms of just access to basic resources, they've been absolutely strangled by um, the United States sanctions, especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union, which has, of course, led them to uh, cut and do some kind of austerity politics internally, which has led them to go, uh, Increase inequality, uh, increase poverty, increase all these things. Uh, has um, that that fall of the Soviet Union has led to 
um, ever since the 1990s has led to kind of a, a tightening of the belts for Cuba that has really not allowed them to ham- has allowed them to kind of hamper or force them to hamper some of their big original economic numbers in terms of the quality they've had for people. Uh, and there's no question they're in a bad way economically, but the question is, where do you put the blame? Whose fault is it? Who is putting the pressure on them? And I think it's clear that um, I think it's clear that the United States is is to blame. Um, we stand with Cuban people in their clarion call for freedom, Biden said. Uh, his comments followed the day after astonishing demonstrations in Cuba, a country known for quashing dissent. Remarkable scenes uh, emerged around the nation on Sunday with thousands of Cubans taking the streets in a surge of protests not seen in nearly 30 years. Of course, going back to the 1990s when the Soviet Union fell, cuts had to be made and people really, like the Cubans, Cuban people were worse off for it. There's no denying that. Cuts had to be made. Um, I think racism, uh, the races, like race, uh, racial inequality increased, kind of income inequality inclu- uh, increased in on the island and a lot of that can be traced back to the fact that the Soviet Union was not able to support them and the economic embargo, uh, again, that Cuba had was so sti- ju- still just as stifling as it ever has been. Uh, Cuba's president, Miguel Diaz-Canel Bermudez, spoke out on national television calling the demonstrators, uh, demonstrations a consequence of, as of a hundred-handed campaign by Washington to exploit people's emotions at a time when the island is facing food scarcity, power cuts, and a growing number of COVID-19 deaths. Um, which, by the way, has been... <laughs> the way they've run their campaign... Uh, the, their um, their COVID-19 response has been incredible. Um, their Cuban COVID numbers uh, have been up there with people like, you know, Vietnam, uh, in terms of just absolutely, really, you know getting they've only had 1537 deaths um this is throughout the entire pandemic they've only had 1537 deaths in 238 cases which unfortunately have really spiked um over the past few months and you know of course resources there are a big question but I think the the big moral of the story is as we continue to watch the situation, we, we don't know how these protest moves are going to call. We, maybe they're trying to the the State Department has something in their sleeves here. They're building up to something bigger. We don't know. Um, but what we do know is, th- and what I would say to anyone who wants to be a smart consumer of American media is, whenever you hear human rights, whenever you hear people are you know suffering. And they they just want democracy from outlets like the New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, mainstream media, whatever. You know that there is something else going on and the true story is not being told. So please, please, please do not be afraid to do a little bit of digging on this issue because it is so, so important um, to, to get the right story and not just be completely manipulated on this because that's what so many people have been uh, been seeing. So... Um, Biden's comments represent something of a shift in tone from that of former President Barack Obama, who uh, had emphasized sweeping aside decades of animosity between the two countries and cutting loose the shackles of the past, uh, but which, by the way, were totally built um, uh, and, and made and forged in U.S. sabotage, sanctions, terrorism, and death. Um, Obama made restoring relations with Cuba a focal point of his foreign policy and significantly expanded ties uh, between the two countries, it did taunt the Trump administration quickly moved to strip away. Um, the protests in Cuba on Sunday offered a rare moment of bipartisanship in the United States, with Democrats and Republicans speaking in light in support of the demonstrations, of course. Uh, you get people like, you know, Val Demings of Florida, who has to scaremonger about Cuba as much as she humanly possibly can, and uh, only in order to lose, as, as the Florida Democrats always do, by increasingly more humiliating margins each time they go to the ballot box. Uh, others blamed the American trade embargo for the protest and the deprivation driving them, a position the Cuban government took on Sunday when the demonstrations erupted. Uh, it, it, the truth is, if one wanted to help Cuba, the first thing they would do is, first thing that should be done, is suspend the, to, to suspend the blockade of Cuba as the majority of the countries in the world, uh, pretty much all the countries in the world, except for two, the United States and Israel, are asking uh, Mexico's president, Andres Manuel López Obrador, told m- reporters on Monday. So, yeah, that really shows you uh, where things are and how 
you know, there has been a com- there's there's complete and total media and cultural satur- saturation to tell you in this country. Oh, look at Fidel Castro. Look how bad he is. Um, you know, Fidel and the Reds are still, you know, ro- lording over Cuba, even though he's been dead for, you know, how, how many years? Is it? When, did, when did he die? I don't, I don't even know. Um, let's see. He died in 2016. Yeah, he, lit- he literally died in 2016. And I'm sure, I'm willing to bet most Americans, the first thing they think of Cuba, uh, when they think of Cuba is they think of the, the current president, Fidel Castro, uh, but yeah, the the complete and total um, cultural push in in media, in politics, on social media, what you see amplified, you know, like this was trending higher in the United States last night than the Euro final was, the Euro final, um, and what we see instead from that is um, these magical shortages that are just happening are the result of, of communism and socialism. Why? Because socialism is... It's just you, they ran out of free stuff to give everybody. I, I guess that makes sense when you know you're completely like the relegated to the second to last paragraph in the in the big story is that oh yeah there is a massive all encompassing economic trade embargo on Cuba and a big reason why they're not able to procure this stuff. So again, absolutely horrific propaganda there that we will do our best to uh, to help people steer clear of shall we say um all right so really some great stuff here in this news story by the daily poster david sirota writing as private equity industry the the private equity equity industry launches ads to protect its lucrative tax preferences we should remember that this is the industry uh unseen by is pretty much the unseen man behind the curtain driving many of the social ills we see today. From high hospital prices to surprise medical bills to nursing home deaths to media layoffs to a housing crisis that has become a human rights emergency, a business we cover put it best. You live in private private equities world even if you don't know it. And the chances are, um, especially if you're in any kind of situation of economic precarity, for example, you, uh, you are trying to buy a house or you work at a media company, you will know it pretty soon. Um, a series of new reports remind us that there is another person behind the monocled, mustache-twirling, oligarch-running Emerald City's secret control panel, and that person isn't a billionaire. It's a faceless pension official in a state capitol or a city hall who's using workers' retirement savings to finance the Wall Street takeover of Oz. In the process, teachers, firefighters, sanitation workers, and other government employees are being fleeced. Their retirement savings are being skimmed by finance industry executives who are using cash to lobby for self-enriching tax breaks while waging a class war on everyone else. All that money could end up bankrolling a new round of housing profiteering and infrastructure privatization using workers' money to wage war on the workers themselves. This is their retirement funds, this is their retirement pensions, and it has been completely sucked dry. The relationship between the finance industry and public pensions has become one of the Gilded Era's biggest schemes to redistribute wealth from workers to Wall Street, but the theft gets barely any attention outside of the business press. David Sorrell has been reporting on it for, uh, for a while. Um, and it faced the wrath of politicians like uh, like Chris Christie for doing so. Uh, this, is, um, this is a clip. This is, uh, we're going to rewind a little bit. Who's been fired. So I'll, depending on how much money I come out with when I get done in this job and find out what's left, I might be more interested. But I'm not interested, and I don't involve myself for a moment in it. So no, there's no appearance issues or anything else. And the, and the article that spurred all this conversation has been written by a guy who is a completely discredited journalist who's been fired David Sirota, for being baby. accurate and inflammatory before. So, you know, right now, anybody who can, you know, pop up on a website calls themselves a journalist. David Sirota is not a journalist. He's a hack. And so, you know, Bob Grady went through the things that he needed to go through to get ethics clearance to be involved in my campaign. And by the way, he's been a friend of mine. Yeah. So that pretty much shows you uh, the funny little history that uh, Chris Christie had with um, David Sirota. So I know. Well, that the term pension is considered a mind-numbing cure for insomnia type topic that the corporate media mostly ignores. But it literally is the difference between people being able to grow old in peace or die uh, young and broke. So <laughs> for a lot of people in this country, people who are lucky enough to still have pensions in the first place. 
In popular imagination, a pension is known, if at all, as a shitty European hotel, a pool of extra cash that Gordon Gecko used to pilfer in the Blue Star Airlines deal, or a small bit of subs- subsistence pay that Grandpa used to get back in the day uh, when times were different. But here's the thing you need to know. Public pensions are a huge business and quite exciting to the world's richest people in the here and now. That's because while fewer and fewer workers today get pension benefits, there's now $5 trillion in public pension systems that have accrued government workers' retirement savings over the decades. That giant pool of capital overseen by appointees tied to Wall Street's bankrolled politicians is the fuel behind the finance industry's conquest of America. This $5 trillion public pension system accruing workers, government uh, government workers, specifically uh, retirement savings over the decades. Uh, pension money is a deferred compensation. Millions of public sector workers who are often paid less than their private sector ca- counterparts have accepted lower upfront wages in exchange for pension contributions to fund their future retirement benefits. Two decades after pension officials began funneling more of that money into private equity, hedge funds, and real estate, roughly one-fifth or about one trillion of the cash is now in these opaque alternative investments. Uh, one, these investments generate outsized fees for financial firms, bankroll the Wall Street's uh, bankroll the Wall Street's uh, political machine, and capitalize the corporations that are pillaging the middle class. This is a wildly lucrative business, and the money managers are now trying to rake in even more from public pensions and break into the even larger 401k market. Uh, you can see investment firms' desperation in Wall Street's cynical ad campaign trying to convince Americans that private equity firms are consistently delivering outsized investment gains for pensioners. They're not. The question is, will the racket continue to get even bigger? Um, and the qu- the answer is um, most likely yes. Pretty much, in many ways, the tale between the unholy union of public pension, the shadowy world of alternative alternative investments, connects much of the reporting uh, done by the Daily Poster and anyone who is serious about journalism, uh, this is pretty much the big heist, the rig game that connects corrupt local officials, soulless Wall Street robber barons, and rapacious corporate CEOs, and the public sector workers who may be unaware that their pension contributions are financing a giant scam that harms everybody. Retirement savings are bankrolling billionaires. Perhaps Funneling pension money into risky and opaque Wall Street schemes could be justified if they produce greater returns for retirees. But while investment fees have been a jackpot for Wall Street firms, the returns have not been so great for pen- pensioners. We'll take a look at two um, industrial states as we um, before we uh, before we close things out here today: uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio. So Pennsylvania. Uh, the pension officials have just admitted they pumped about two-thirds of the state's retirement system assets into, quote-unquote, alternative investments. The strategy generated below-average returns for retirees, but it generated $4.3 billion worth of fees for Wall Street firms, which is more than the entire amount that workers paid into the fund over that same time period. So pretty much over that time, uh, Wall Street had profited more than the entire amount workers had even put into the system. So this is a system that set up by state uh, st- state officials who are putting all this stuff, uh, a lot of times in these kind of uh, red states where most of the government in Pennsylvania is red, Ohio, same same situation. Um, and I'm sure, you know, you, th- you think Cuomo's managing the pensions better up there in Albany? You, you're crazy. Um, but... Nevertheless, there is an incredibly damaging situation going on here um, where people are getting screwed. They're getting they're seeing returns that are below average, below what they should be. And Wall Street is profiting in a big way. So, in other words, all the money pulled out of Pennsylvania's public workers paychecks in the past four years was suppo- that was supposed to go to the retirement savings was instead used to pay Wall Street firms fees, and in exchange, workers were given investment returns that did not beat a low-fee stock index fund. So absolutely awful. And most of the money that they put in ended up going back to Wall Street in these alternative investment um, situations over here. So in next door in Ohio, a new forensic investigation by former Security and Exchange Commission attorney Ted Seidel uh, estimated that the state teachers' pension funds is paying more than $460 million in fees every year, and alternative investments have wildly underperformed compared to their projections. And, uh, yeah, it makes you wonder, who are making those, pro- those projections in the first place? Those fees are more than twice the amount the state saved in 2017 when officials uh, halted the cost of living increases that would allow the pension benefits to keep up with inflation. 
uh, of course. Even more shocking, Seidel reported that the pension fund is also likely paying big fees to private equity firms on uncommitted capital, which is money set aside to be invested but not yet deployed. So they're setting up to do even more of this. He estimates that Ohio pensioners are annually forking over $143 million of such fees for investments that haven't even been made yet. That's enough to restore most of the cost of living cuts, but is instead being used to pay big investment firms. As Cito puts it, the state is effectively paying managers for doing nothing. All these figures may be understated. A study last year said that the CEM bench, uh, by CEM benchmarking concluded that only about half of investment fees in America's multi-trillion dollar pension system are even being disclosed. The SEC has twice warned of rampant fee fraud in, private e- in the private e- equity industry, but workers and journalists can't see all those fees because many of the states and cities passed Wall Street sculpts of laws exempting investment firms from open records statutes. Ohio and Pennsylvania are hardly isolated incidents. State and local pension funds are among the biggest backers of alternative investments that are meant to be a huge transfer of wealth from retirees to Wall Street firms. On one, uh, one 2020 analysis by Oxford professor Ludovic Philippou, found that private equity firms have raked in nearly a quarter trillion dollars in performance fees over the last 15 years. In California, one pension fund alone has shelled out more than $3.4 billion in fees to these firms. Only wonder what fraction of that is actually uh, meant or ended up going uh, to the workers when all was said and done. All right. Well, really just a horrific story there. That story, though, by David Toretta does go on for a bit longer. It's a great deep dive piece. In the Daily Poster, uh, definitely worth a read if you're interested in that. Uh, but hopefully, well, I think we got a good gist of it there. Uh, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for listening. We'll have more for you on Haiti um, on Thursday. But come back Wednesday for another episode of Newsflash.